Hey guys and welcome to the next tutorial of ethical hacking and penetration testing via Kali Linux. So in this tutorial we would be looking a look at the birthday theorem. So yep, it is exactly what it looks like. Gx raised to n plus y raised to n is unequal to z raised to n where n is less than 2 and this might go completely bouncer for you and you might not understand any of these things and I completely understand that. So to be more precise, uh, the birthday theorem was previously known as capture recapture statistics, which was invented in the 1930s to count fish. Yeah, seriously fish. Suppose let's say there are n a number of fish in a lake and you can catch uh, m number of them, tag them and throw them back. Then when you first catch a fish you have tagged already, m should be about the square root of n. And the in uh, intuitive reason this holds is that once you have vn number of samples each could potentially match any of the others so the number of pos possible matches is about v uh, capital n v capital n and or just n which is what you exactly need so this might be a bit confusing uh for you to understand you can just go ahead and repeat the tutorial but i cannot make it more easier than it is exactly um, what i could say or i can say that that's the most easier definition i could give you right now you can go and search multiple things on the web to go and search more about the birthday theorem. But uh, uh, I have actually went ahead and researched a lot of things about birthday theorem and this was the e easiest I could go ahead and teach you right now. So the birthday theorem has many applications for security engineer. Let's say for example, if we have a biometric system that can authenticate a person's claim, identify with a probability of 1 in a million that two uh, randomly selected subjects will be falsely identified as the same person. This does not mean that we can use it as a reliable means of identification in a university with a user population of 20,000 staff and patients. Just because there will be almost 200 million possible pairs. In fact, you can expect to find the first collision, the first pair of people who can be mistaken for each other by the system once you have let's say somewhat a thousand people enrolled. In some application collisions, search attacks are not the pro are not a problem, such as in a challenge response protocol where an attacker would have uh, to be able to find uh, the answer to the challenge just issued, where you can prevent challenges uh, from repeating itself. For example, challenge might not uh, be really random but generated by encrypting a counter. In identify friend or foe IFF systems, for example. Common equipment has a response length of 40 to 80 bits and that's how what birthday theorems are. After that we have random generators that's stream ciphers versus the block ciphers and the second basic cryptographic primitive is the random generator also known as a key a stream a generator or a stream cipher. This is also a random function but unlike in the hash function case it has a short input and a long output. So if we had a good pseudo random function whose input and output were a billion bits long and we never wanted to handle any objects other larger than this, we could turn it into a hash function by throwing away all uh, but a few thousand bits of the output and a stream cipher by padding all but a few hundred bits of the input with a constant. At the conceptual level, however, it's common to think of a stream cipher as a random oracle whose input length is fixed while the output is a very long stream of bits uh, known as key stream. It can be again used to uh, simply, uh, quite simply to protect the confidentiality of backup data. We can go to the key stream generator, enter a key, get a long a file of random bits um, be it exclusive or with our plain text data to get ciphertext which we then uh, send to our backup contractor. We can think of uh, the elf uh, generating uh, a random tape of the required length each time he is presented with a new key as input giving it to us and keeping a copy of it on his scroll for reference in case he is given the same input again. So if we need to recover the data we go back to the generator enter the same key get the same long file of random data and exclusive or it with our ciphertext to get our plain text data back again. Other people with access to the key stream generator won't be able to generate the same key stream unless they know the key exactly. And that's what um, the stream ciphers are. As for block ciphers, it's uh, the third type of primitive and the most important in modern commercial cryptography is the block cipher, 
which I will model as uh, the random permutation. Here, the function is invertible. So let me just skip. Okay, uh, and yeah, I was saying invertible. So uh, the input plain text and the output ciphertext are of a fixed size. With Playfair, let's say both input and output are two characters. With DES, they are both bit strings of 64 bits. Whatever the number of symbols and the underlying alphabet encryption acts on a block of uh, block of fixed length. So if you want to encrypt a shorter input, you have to pad it as with our final Z in our Playfair example. So you can visualize block encryption such as we have an elf in a box with a dice and a scroll. On the left is a column of plain text and on the right is a column of ciphertext. So when we ask the elf to encrypt a message, it checks in the left hand column to see if it has a record of it. If not, it uses dice to, to generate a random ciphertext of the appropriate size and it should be one that does not appear in the right hand column of the scroll and write down the plain ciphertext in the scroll. If it does find a record, it gives us the corresponding ciphertext from the right hand column and when it is asked to decrypt, the elf does the same but with the function on the columns reversed. So he takes the input ciphertext, checks it but this time on the right hand scroll and if he finds it, he gives the uh, message uh, with which it was previously associated. If not, he generates a message at random which does not already appear in the left hand column and notes it down. A block cipher is a keyed family of uh, pseudo random permutations. For each key we have a single permutation that is let's say independent of each other. So you can think of each key as corresponding to a different scroll. The intuitive idea over here is that given the plain text and the key, a cipher machine should output the cipher text and given the ciphertext key, uh, ciphertext and the key, it should output the plain text. But given only the plain text and the ciphertext, it should output nothing. And that's how they work exactly. And after that, now we have the digital signature. Uh, the final primitive uh, over here, which I will define here today, is the digital signature. The basic idea is that a signature on a message can be created by only one person, but it can be checked by anyone. It can thus perform the sort of function in the electronic world that ordinary signatures do in the world of paper. Signature schemes can be deterministic or randomized. In the first, uh, computing a signature on a message will always give the same result. In the second, it will give a different result each time you compute. And when you uh, go down, when it provides different results each time you compute, it is more like a handwritten signature. So no two are ever alike, but uh, the bank has a means of deciding whether a given signature specimen is genuine or forged. So similarly, uh, signature schemes may or may not support message recovery. If they do, uh, if they do, then given the signature, anyone can recover the message on which it was generated. And if they don't, then the verifier needs to know or guess the message before he can perform the verification. So there are also more specialized signature schemes such as blind signatures and threshold signatures. But I will postpone the discussion uh, for now. Formally, a signature scheme like public encryption uh, key scheme has a key pair generation function that given a random input R will return two keys. So S and R that's the private signing key and V R the public signature verification key with properties such as given the public signature verification key V R it is infeasible to compute uh, the private signature key as R. And there is a, a digital signature function that given a message M and a private signature key as R, it will produce a signature SIGSR that's size R uh, for the M. And there is a signature verification function that given the signature size R M and the uh, public signature verification key VR will also will always output true if the signature was computed correctly with SR, otherwise it will go ahead and give the output as false. So yep, and that would be it for this tutorial. I'll be ending with this digital signature platform. In the next tutorial, I'll be going ahead and computing, uh, completing the basics parts and the advantages and disadvantages of ciphertext.